It's early, too, real early on a Friday. I'm really super glad you guys could make it. it. It is early. It is a Friday. You're probably tired, understandably, but you made it. You did it. You're wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk today about uh, interior design and games, uh, mastering space and mastering place. I'm Dan Cox. Uh, this was an awesome portrait done for me by one of my coworkers at Capybara Games, where I work now. I'm working on Below. And prior to this, I was working at uh, Ubisoft Toronto, working on Splinter Cell Blacklist and a secret game as well. A bunch of other studios for most of my career as well, dealing with three-dimensional games and moving around fully 3D spaces. But for a lot of my career, the vast majority of it, I've been teaching at Seneca College, teaching environment art. This has been an incredibly fulfilling experience for me. It's taught me a lot about what people do and how they might create spaces, my students would create competent, capable work, uh, but I couldn't quite understand why consistently. Uh, a lot of times they'd start with something bad. It wouldn't work. It, it would be ugly. But we would be able to wrangle it into something powerful and quite of a high quality, but I couldn't understand why. During much of this time, I was watching interior design shows with my wife. These were really, really interesting because they would start to talk about the things that I couldn't articulate in class to my students. So I thought, well, there must be something here. So I did a talk about it. Uh, last year, I also talked about what interior design can teach us about environment art. You can watch this on the GDC vault. And a lot of this talk was about the fact that we should look to this field to start getting some ideas. And it glossed over some ideas of, of what that might be. And some of those to cover today, because we're going to be talking about them a little bit more, are that of contrast and repetition. So I wanted to cover them a little bit. Contrast is the idea that we draw out contrast from one element from the space around it, either through color, shape, value, or anything along those lines to emphasize it. We can also do the opposite, reducing the contrast of an element by, just by changing the color of the wall behind it to de-emphasize those elements. We can also use contrast to, br uh, to bring out any of the kind of important parts of the room such as the table or chairs or the functional pieces. We can use contrast in detail, contrast in pattern, contrast in rhythm of lines or just the shapes of the objects themselves. Now, repetition is incredibly useful for us as well. This is something that interior designers use a lot. So what we're seeing in these images is a repetition of color. Much of these colors are being drawn from specific parts of the room and repeated throughout. That gives us a through line that makes many disparate elements still work. Even if we have shapes that are different, a consistent through line of either an animal shape in general, or the ceramic, or the white elements, gives us that through line so that even though the shapes don't work, these things still go together. We can even have spaces with a ton of different smaller repeating elements within. So a space may not necessarily look immediately appealing, but it still works. But the problem with last year's talk was it actually happened to be a little bit too short. And so this year, I kind of wanted to do something a little bit more uh, in depth, something that really concretely deals with some of the techniques that interior design deals with. And in doing some of this research, I started to find that there was one thing that kind of surprised me. I thought interior design was useful last year. But this time around, with a little bit more research, I started to find that environment artists must understand interior design. They absolutely have to. The fact of the matter is, if we don't understand interior design, it's like a character artist not understanding anatomy. For interior design, that's very much our kind of anatomy study. It's the bare bones, basics, fundamental understanding that we need to build off of. Because otherwise, we're at the whims of taste or experience. And both of those can be very difficult to come by and are not easy to teach. Either we have to just trust in our instincts, and if you don't have them, then you're in a bit of trouble. And if you don't have a ton of experience in dealing with this already, you don't have a lot to build off of. So that is where interior design comes in. It's got that fundamental understanding that we can start from to build off of. But why should we study interior design? Why not games? Why not movies? Why not concept art? Well, the fact is, if we study movies or concept art or just illustration, we're primarily dealing with two-dimensional compositions. Interior design immediately deals with the space around you and everything that's perceivable within that space in all directions. 
which is not what movies deal with. They're not concerned with it. They shouldn't be. But for us, we are. But why not study games? Well, the problem is, although games can be incredibly, incredibly beautiful and incredibly well done, it's like looking to anime for trying to get anatomy understanding. You're already building off of somebody's uh, either simplified or exaggerated understanding of what anatomy or interior design might be. And so you're building off of not the best foundation. So the main thing that we need to keep in mind is that when we start with a good foundation, we can elevate our craft and create something that builds off of something solid. However, that does not apply to other kinds of games. If you're making something like Kentucky Route Zero or a game that primarily deals with two-dimensional compositions, you really do not need to spend a lot of time focusing on interior design. It's not the same craft. It's a different setup. You are dealing with the rule of thirds and other compositional elements. However, if you're doing something like Bioshock or any kind of game where the player has a free-moving camera, that is where it's most important for us to really focus on interior design because they deal with the things that we deal with. What are those things? These are our interior design principles, which is that of order, enrichment, and expression. Order is bringing chaos away and in, uh, inputting some kind of order and some arrangement to specific elements. When we're making games, we're composing spaces full of many disparate kind of elements. And we need to arrange them in such a way that a person can understand where they're situated in space. Enrichment is the idea of elevating the core experience of being inside of a space, making it enriched, making it elevated and interesting at a very, very core level, totally separate from narrative, which is expression. Expression is the suggestion of the mood within a space. It's the suggestion of the tone or the story or your personal narrative towards that space. But none of these principles exist in isolation. All of these must connect together. They cannot be detached. You can't have a room that is purely order, which is just bare bones basic, that doesn't express something about the people that live there. None of these things can be detached from each other in any way, shape, or form. They're always connected. The breakdown of these ideas is that order deals with orientation and spatial definition. Enrichment deals with complexity, manipulation of form, and expression deals with communication and narrative. First, we'll talk about order. Order, order deals with the arrangement and position of elements in space so as to increase our sense of understanding within that place. We deal with complex spaces all the time, made up of many different kinds of elements, and when placed together, the user should be able to understand where they are, which can give them a feeling of ease. That's powerful for us. If we don't arrange things, people can get lost and lose all sense of orientation. Interior design really focuses on the idea of orientation. But how do they do that? Well, one, first, they need to deal with pattern, but not patterns like these. Oftentimes when we think of interior design, we may think of interior design dealing with patterns, like literally like Damask and Paisley and like all these other fancy patterns, but that's not what I'm talking about today. The kinds of patterns I'm talking about are our perceptible patterns within space. The pattern in this scene, in both of these areas, is a pattern of color, a reuse of color that we can perceive and see that there's that coherent pattern. The pattern here is that of ceramic, white, animal, that's a perceivable pattern that we have. There's also a hierarchy of pattern, most noticeable patterns and then less noticeable. The first being rectilinear elements in these scenes, and then that of uh, rich red carpet areas with smaller patterns built within, that of uh, pastel blues or cool colors in the background, a separate hierarchy of different types of patterns that we can perceive. That can help some of our orientation within a space. But what is orientation? When we walk into a room or a set of rooms, we're always taking in mental images of each part separately. And then our brains try to put them all back together afterwards, where we gain a sense of orientation for where we were and then where we might end up next. When we see these, we create small mental images of each area. But it becomes tricky to necessarily put them all together and if we can't do that, we can lose all sense of orientation. We can become very disoriented and totally freaked out. So how do we create a sense of orientation quickly and easily? Well, 
Interior design's already dealt with some of this through some studies, and you can deal with identity, structure, and meaning to implement a sense of orientation within spaces. Identity is the idea that you create an iconic element that people can easily remember and come back to. So when they imagine a space, they know where it might be situated because they can easily recall what was there. Structure is the pattern within those spaces. It's the repetition of certain elements that we can perceive that are easily memorable. In this case, the arrangement of the buildings, their closeness together, and the size of each kind of unit that you can see. That's the perceptible pattern here, rather than the buildings themselves. Meaning is your personal meaning towards that space, something that you're remembering about it because it means something to you. So it's easy to recall a space because you're able to remember specific parts about it because they're meaningful to you. So how does that work for this? When we see each part, it's hard to understand how that whole might look, how the entirety of it might be. However, if we have identity in that, we can get a much quicker idea of what the rest of these things might be and how those other details might relate. The structure starts to tell us more about that space and give us something to recall. And meaning is, frankly, if you were hugging a tiger, you would remember each little part of one. Because that's what this was. It was a small part of this kind of tiger. And now we're able to see the whole of it, and with those identifiable pieces, we're able to recall what this whole thing might be. But how do we define space when we're dealing with orientation and order? Well, first we need to deal with enclosure, things that exist around us because we are dealing with interior design. You can think of enclosure like your emotions, your body, and uh, your spirit as uh, water. And the enclosure is like a glass. When we have enclosure around us, such as floors and a wall, we have an enclosure behind us. Our emotions will flow out in front of us in all directions. This is better than having nothing and can at least give us some sort of safety within a space. If we have a hallway kind of situation, two walls on both sides of us, our emotions are pushed backwards and forwards. And if we have two walls to the corner of us, we can, a, we can get a greater sense of ease because we're able to push ourselves back towards that corner and have a little bit more enclosure than we would normally have. With enclosure, we start to deal with spatial definition. Spatial definition, in its most literal sense, is literal space. Walls, floors, ceiling. Things that fully block off one space from another. Let's look at impl actually applying some literal space into a situation and see how we get orientation from it. We have a fully symmetrical space right now. In all directions, everything is the same. And as we start to move through this space, we can see every direction is the exact same. When we pass through one hallway and look in both directions, we see the same exact thing. As we round a corner, the same thing again. We can start to really lose orientation here. If we're not paying close attention, it can, it can become really easy to start wondering if we already passed this hallway. Have we been here before? I can barely remember. Are we north, south, east, west? Well, let's go to the center. What do we see now? Where the hell are we? That starts to become a huge problem for us. In fact, Silent Hill's PT teaser game actually used this lack of orientation, that repetition through a space where you don't know how many times you've gone through it, to scare the crap out of you. If we want to increase orientation, we need to create perceptible patterns. So in this situation, we actually have specific noticeable angles and details that always change. So you can always orient yourselves. When you always see a certain set of doors with a certain perceivable pattern, it becomes very easy to understand where you are in space. Each section is slightly different from the others, which allows you to always understand where you are. In this case, it's a little bit heavy-handed, and the scene is very, very simple. So we're able to perceive the patterns very quickly and easily because there's very little distracting us from them. But each area, slightly different. However, this is literal space, walls and floors. What else can we deal with? We can deal with that of implied space. Implied space is the suggestion of one space from another. In this case, we have the literal space, the encompassing box. We also have these two spaces within. One is defined by the dropped ceiling, and the next is defined by the lack of that dropped ceiling. The ways we can imply space 
in something like this is that we first deal with our literal space, and then we can compartmentalize this into smaller spots. One by changing the pattern of a floor, arranging elements within a group. Even light fixtures above create a perceived spatial definition on the ground below. We can also define that space through dropping the level of the floor, and all of those things will go together to create discrete elements of a larger space, which allows us to understand the larger area in a much easier way. For each of these scenes, there's implied spaces within. That allows us to break down what the larger space is and have a better sense of understanding where each part might be and how they relate to each other. So for example, the large tree elements in here, in the first image, break up the room into about three different larger spaces. The tables and chairs also define another smaller set of space. This is good for us because, like enclosure, it allows us to feel a little bit more comfortable in individual pockets. And all of this can be done without lighting. A lot of times in games, a lot of environment artists can really heavily focus on lighting as being the way that we move people through space or give them a sense of orientation or tell them where to go. And that's just one tool that interior designers use. They actually very rarely use it for leading a person through a space. It's just there to enliven the experience. To recap, when we're thinking of order, we want to think of orientation, which involves identity, structure, and meaning. And then we can think about spatial definition, which is both literal and implied. In practice, the things we want to do is look at scenes, watch through these, and start to ask questions about how order exists. How are they creating orientation here? How are they creating identity? Identifiable structures that are easy to remember. What kind of structure, what repeating pattern are we seeing in this space for us to be able to understand where we are? What's the spatial definition? Where are we seeing literal space being defined? And where are we seeing implied space being defined? The carpets, for example, are another form of implied space. They separate the room. We have literal spaces, implied spaces, to create orientation, we have a number of elements in here which have a specific identity to them, which allows us to know which floor we're on. The structure also slightly changes, but it's a less perceptible pattern. The meaning for the space for us is if you've been playing through the game, you're going to remember your interactions in this area. When we start moving to these other floors, notice how they create order by changing the identity of certain areas. The color schemes are a form of identity as well. By asking ourselves these questions as we move through spaces, we give ourselves a foundation for which we understand how we might use some of these techniques. Next, we can talk about enrichment. Enrichment is elevating the experience in a space, making it more interesting for you, just either on a, on a movement kind of basis or from just a visual field kind of standpoint. Enrichment is just about the experience of looking at something and having that be elevated from the norm that we might be used to. It also deals with the ideas of approachability. Visually, we like scenes that have a lot of complexity in them. That's just a number of studies that, have interior, design, that interior design has done. And so we've, we've got a scale of complexity on the base here and a scale of how much somebody might like something. What they found was, as a scene gets more complex in our visual field, people start to like it more. However, it starts to taper off at a certain point, and if a scene starts to get too complex, people start to like it less and want to approach it significantly less, which means right in the middle, we have this area of optimum complexity. So if a space is too boring and simple, you don't necessarily want to dive in and go there. However, if the space is too complex, you also don't want to either. What they found was the spaces that people appreciated the most were naturalistic spaces, where we can see perceptible patterns and repetition of elements, because our eyes love to break down scenes and visual areas into smaller component parts and actually do some work, but they don't want to do too much. So what kind of techniques can we use to increase approachability when dealing with complexity? Well, we deal with the techniques of complexity, coherence, legibility, and mystery. Complexity is that we do like to see complexity in our visual field. We like to see things that we can break down and compartmentalize and do work with. Animals love to break, out, break down patterns. And the more times that we're able to do that, 
the more a space can be interesting within that threshold. But the thing is we need to balance that threshold. How do we do that without just having like a, a medium complexity world all the time? Well, we can use legibility. Legibility is our ability to break down a space into those component parts. It's when we can break down specific elements and understand how to chunk out a space. A lack of legibility means that we can't really understand what's going on. And even though the space may not be necessarily that complex, we can't tell what's going on, and it becomes less approachable. However, if you increase legibility in a space, you can still have significant amounts of complexity within it, lots of little details. But a lack of legibility with those same details starts to become a problem. Next, we can talk about coherence, which is our appreciation for patterns within space and perceiving those patterns. So in this area, we've got straight lines with an angular element built in. That's repeated through the chairs and all the different types of areas in the back as well, where you get straight lines and a little bit of an angle. In this scene as well, we have this really, really interesting ceiling piece with a really cool pattern, but it doesn't really fit with everything else. Except if you notice the railings have a double line. That double line also repeats itself through the ceiling and is almost the exact same distance apart creating that coherence that makes some of this actually work together. Mystery is the idea that we want to investigate spaces, that we want to move into them. The more you present something that somebody might want to investigate further, the more enriched that space can be, and the more somebody might want to investigate it. Any time that that kind of happens, a space becomes a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more interesting to explore. My favorite example of that is with Dark Souls. If you're in the Dark Root Basin, if you're aware of it, Way off in the distance, there's these tendrily things moving off in the distance, and you're wondering what the hell it is. You're scared, but you really want to know what it is. And it's a freaking hydra, <laughs> which is unpleasant once you get there. But all of that leads to that mystery and leads you to want to investigate further, even when in Dark Souls it's not a great idea to do that. Which leads us to an universal enrichment. The fact is, if enrichment kind of deals with the ideas of approachability, then we can have a universal form of enrichment. It doesn't need to just deal with interior design. It can deal with anything. We can have enrichment that is detached from narrative, from other kinds of expression in that space, and have things and techniques that we can use in almost any scenario to enrich it. So for example, the manipulation of our enclosing space. By default, this room is a perfect example of it. Our walls are straight and our floors are flat and the ceiling is also flat as well. This is what we're used to, so it is not an enriched space because it's just the default for us. If we start to move those things, manipulate that enclosing space, it, become, it can become a more enriching area to be within, something that's unexpected and can be something that we can enjoy being within. Some examples of that can be really, really interesting enriching spaces for us. We don't always have to use it. It doesn't have to be extreme, but it is there for us to use. We can also have the manipulation of that enclosing space over a broader area, not just the walls and floors on a small area, but actually over the entirety of a space. These concentric circles conforming to our walls give us something to work with for our enclosing space. This area is enriched in a small way because this changes our experience of the norm. We have to move through curved areas where we wouldn't normally do that, and it just makes for something that is slightly enriched. When we know how to slightly enrich something, we can start to use more exaggerated versions of it to get a greater impact. And the fact is, this is more than usable on just interior design ideas. Caves are already manipulated in closing surfaces. All those spaces have all those kinds of angles to them. They're changed in this exact same way. And so these kinds of patterns are something that we already appreciate in other kinds of spaces. So you can use these kinds of techniques in any scenario. We can also think about surface articulation. In a lot of situations, we might have a flat surface, which is relatively simple. But if we start to add pattern to it, something that's perceivable, then the space starts to become a little bit more interesting, as long as the pattern's not too repetitive. If the pattern is incredibly repetitive, it's not that interesting for us to break down. However, if we start to change that pattern a little bit and start to make the pattern slightly less perceptible or change it up even a bit more, that can be something that's really enriching. It gives our eyes more things to work with. If the pattern starts to become imperceptible, 
that can start to lead to a lack of legibility or coherence, which makes it somewhat less approachable, somewhat less, not necessarily enriched, but a little bit more confusing. If we start to make that pattern more perceptible again, then you can start to have something that works. We can use these kinds of surface articulations to lead the player through a space, to lead them through an area, to break up certain areas so that a hallway doesn't look like it becomes too long. And those are really, really powerful for us. Patterns uh, in our surface articulation can be just flat on the wall, just painted on, or they can actually have a relief to them, uh, a thickness and a shape. And all of these kind of things can move you through a space and just elevate the experience of being in there. Surface articulation can exist as well on non-man-made patterns, things that are just a little bit more naturalistic or normal. These are all forms of surface articulation. Whether they're intended or not, they still create the same impact for us as users. Next, we can think about spatial composition. If we don't compose our elements in space, they become very confusing and we can't make sense of why they're there and what they're doing. If we compose them in space, it becomes a little bit easier for us to make sense of them. This increases their legibility. Total chaos becomes really difficult to deal with. However, if we create that order to it, the space becomes more legible. If we have a ton of chairs and tables all just scattered throughout a space, it certainly has complexity, but very, very, very little legibility. If we don't balance those things, then we lose some of the enrichment that we might get out of these. Moving through this space is an enriching experience because we kind of have to move around, but we start to lose all sense of what's happening, and we could utilize this much better. However, if we create too much order to this, the space is not necessarily all that enriched. It's composed, certainly, but is not necessarily that interesting for us to move through. Our enrichment can happen on more than the visual field. It can also happen on the movement field. As we move through a space differently, just by rearranging the composition of these elements, our movement path has been changed. This becomes a small, slight, subtle enrichment to what we had before by just spatially composing our elements differently. We can also change up the pattern between two areas. Our spatial compositions can suggest two distinct areas with multiple movement schemes built within. In each area, you have to move through the space slightly different. But the composition of these elements also lets us feel at ease because we can compartmentalize ourselves into smaller parts. When we see a scene that has no spatial composition, it can become kind of disorienting and somewhat scary and freak freaky to be within. But if each area gives us a spot that we can kind of relax within, then we can feel a little bit more at ease moving through it and around it. Novelty is the idea that we want something that's going to stand out from everything else. That's the easiest form of enrichment and one that we use a ton and are really good at. Novelty is just having something that's impactful and interesting and just quite a bit different from everything else. It's enriching because when you see it, you're just excited and it's awesome. The problem is, if we use too much novelty at too high of an intensity all the time, it can become difficult for a user to notice every time that we did it. So the problem is, is if we start to have too much novelty, we're gonna have to use really exaggerated forms of novelty for somebody to spot it. Because we have to go so far in that direction. If we think of novelty like a value scale, going from black to white, white being the highest form of novelty, and black being another extremely high form of novelty. If we just have black and white with no gradients in between, things can become difficult to understand on the whole. If we look at this image and imagine it like the experience of being in an entire game from beginning to end, each little part of it is black, white, tons of novelty in each little section. If we don't control that value scale, that intensity of our novelty, it's hard to understand what our whole experience was, how to remember each little part, because everything's identifiable, because everything's memorable, nothing's memorable. If we control that a little bit better, we can start to understand what the entirety of that experience might be, because each part has a little bit more value change to it. One of the best examples I can think of for this is the Stanley Parable. 
Each area that you're going through kind of repeats itself a lot. But little parts change, and you start to notice that novelty incredibly quickly because there's very little else happening. So every time something changes, that novelty is incredibly usable and incredibly memorable. We can also think about tension. Tension is this feeling that as we move through a space, if the space starts to enclose around us a little bit more, that's an enriching experience. It's something interesting for us. We need to release that tension, and we can increase or release it in many different kinds of ways, either gradually or abruptly. A great example of this is through the recent Uncharted videos. Where as he moves through this cave, the tension starts being increased. As he walks through more caves, the tension starts increasing a little bit more, and then a little bit more, to the maximum kind of intensity that we can get for some of this tension. And then that release of tension creates a really enriching experience for us. So to recap, when we think about enrichment, we can think about the ideas of approachability, complexity, legibility, coherence, and mystery. Our spatial compositions, our manipulation of enclosing space, surface articulation, novelty, and tension. All of these things are incredibly useful for us to deal with for enriching a space and enriching the experience for a user inside of it. And it's important for us to ask ourselves these questions when we see a space. When we look at an area, how is it creating enrichment? How is it dealing with balancing the complexity of the scene? What about the legibility? Where are you seeing a re repetition of certain patterns that go together to create that coherence? What are the spatial compositions that we're seeing here to break things apart? What about tension and the release of that tension? How are they dealing with the manipulation of enclosing space? Are they using it? Are they not using it? Do they need to? Balancing each of those things is incredibly valuable for us. What are they doing for surface articulation? Are they doing anything for it? Is it necessary? How are they creating novelty? Each room in these spaces actually has a form of novelty, whether really strong or relatively subtle. That novelty may not exist between all to, like many other rooms between the entire world, but each space feels slightly different. And the novelty here also comes from that blue light in this area. It gives us something different to deal with. When we look at this back area, we have a sense of mystery. We want to investigate it because it's quite a bit different from the other areas, and it starts to be something that's worthwhile to explore. There's complexity in these spaces, but balanced with legibility and coherence. All of these things are useful for us to ask ourselves about when we deal with the space so we can understand the simpler ideas of how we might use those techniques. Last, we can talk about expression. Expression is how we deal with the mood or tone or narrative of a space. So when we're dealing with expression, it's what we're telling the user the broad ideas of a space. It's our communication with the user and their ability to maybe understand what that communication is. We're actually really good at expression. Interior design is probably uh, the least effective in telling us stuff about expression because that's what we generally focus on. We're always telling stories in spaces. That's actually really what we're good at. But there are interesting things that expression deals with in interior design that I found helpful. And it's less of a technique specifically and more of a mindset when dealing with a space. And that's the ideas of world expression, inhabitant expression, and symbolism. So when we're thinking about world expression, the techniques that we want to specifically think about is that of historical and cultural. Historical is when we're dealing with the history of a space told through its visuals. What time period was this place built within? What was the era around that? And how does that space express that history? Each of these kinds of places expresses its history through the details within. It's certainly enriched and it has order. Again, we can't disconnect those things. But when we're thinking about historical expression, we're just thinking about what the history is and how to express that. For Portal 2, the dilapidated sense of space here suggests something about the history. Especially if you've played Portal 1, you start to get a good sense of how history is being expressed within this space. 
the inclusion of 1920s kind of propaganda and shapes and details in Colombia really suggests something about the history of this space and how it relates. Fictional spaces all still have their own inherent history that can be expressed. We can also think about cultural expression. Whenever we're expressing a type of culture in a space, you're using symbols and things like that to suggest or express a specific type of culture there. It can also be really heavy handed and maybe even really tacky, but it is still a form of expression. You're expressing a type of culture there. For Columbia, that's the expression of really heavy handed Americana and religious figures, or in some cases, being really stereotypical and cliche to kind of emphasize the certain tones that that group might be having in terms of how they perceive other kinds of cultures. We can think about inhabitant expression. And by inhabitants, I mean anybody that lives inside of a space or exists within it, either temporarily or otherwise. The inhabitant may have built the space that they're within, or they may just simply be squatting. The identity of them is going to help us understand how to deal with what they might be expressing within that space. The techniques that we can use within that are that of attitude and their sophistication and their self-presentation of those ideas. Attitude can be how friendly or unfriendly the inhabitants may be and their expression of those things within. They can be something that they've either built to suggest that kind of attitude and expressing that or something that they've simply placed on the walls themselves. All of these kinds of things are a form of inhabitant expression. When you go through that space, you understand who these people might be and what their friendliness or attitude might be. It can also be a sense of their humor or any kind of thing that tells you something about who they are, who they think they are, and maybe who they want to be. Their sophistication suggests their appreciation for taste and aesthetics. Sophistication, in terms of how we relate that through the inhabitant expression, is how we make sure that they have a clear sense of how much they appreciate the aesthetic somewhere, making sure that they have a high quality sense of taste or that they maybe don't and aren't concerned with those kinds of things. And all of this is going to be modified by the self-presentation of those people, how much they want you to see that kind of presentation of sophistication or attitude. In one situation, to express their attitude, they may just let things be on the walls and tons of graffiti everywhere to suggest the kind of attitude and their appreciation of sophistication, or they may clean some of that stuff up. The same kind of space, but simplified somewhat because they don't want to express too much of that attitude. We can also think about symbolism, that of either the feeling of ascending and descending or admittance and refusal. Symbolism is something that's incredibly valuable for us and is still very often used in interior design. It's that broader communication of story and a universal human experience for users. This is incredibly useful for us because we can suggest broad ideas rather than always just small ones. It's very easy for a player to miss these things because symbolism is always very important uh, for their cultural experience, for their personal experience. Some users will not see that symbolism or will not recognize it. But to have it there is still incredibly powerful for us. The ideas of ascending and descending. When you move up through a space, there's a suggestion of like sort of a heavenly movement, which can still be modified, again, based on a person's personal experience or cultural experiences. We can utilize these things, again, in Portal 2, where you descend and you fall and you lose something of yourself. These kinds of broader symbolism creates a narrative that's somewhat separate from the obvious explicit narrative. The ideas of admittance and refusal is that when you want somebody to come into a space, you can show them that. You can symbolize that through open doors, showing lots of light into that space to make sure that somebody feels like they are very much welcome. Or doing the opposite, creating that sense that somebody is not allowed into that space, symbolizing those things and suggesting that through our expression. But how do we do this in practice? Well, Mad Men's a great example in an office. In this kind of space, this is also enriched and there's order and all those kinds of things, but for expression, 
we're specifically getting an idea of what the history of this place is because we can see how these things look and what kind of time period they express. Also, there's clear cultural expression here because we can recognize how that relates to the culture that this place existed within. Also, inhabitant expression. An office with a ton of booze in it suggests something about the inhabitants there. Whether it's already placed in advance or only occasionally placed just based on where they're working or what they're doing. But how does this relate to expression and how can we separate them in a clear and easy way? Well, when we think of expression versus enrichment, one of the best places that you can look to to understand how those pieces might differ is to go to an interior design show that deals with a place where they need to sell a house. Because in many of those situations, people are trying to make sure that they remove their personal expression their identity within that space and create a space that's purely enriched and just visually pleasing to move within. The first example here has a ton of expression within it. But somebody may not want to buy that, so they want the simplified space. One space is not necessarily ugly or bad. It is simply too identifiable for the expression of the person within. And the next space is, again, not necessarily better per se, but it is focusing on a lack of identity within that space. To recap, when we're thinking about expression, we want to think about world expression, and we want to ask ourselves about the questions within that space. What is its historical relevance, and what is it expressing about the culture there? What about the inhabitant expression? What's their attitude, and what's their sophistication, and how are they presenting that? We can also think about the symbolism of the space and what that's suggesting, either through the ascending and descending, or the admittance and refusal. When we see these, these kinds of images, we can ask ourselves these kinds of questions about how they're being expressed. And we can also then think about how that's being changed in a space like this. How are they presenting their, history, their, their world history or their culture? Are they doing that? How much? What's their attitude? And how much are they presenting that? So the question is, should we start hiring interior designers? No, no, absolutely not. The fact is a lot of interior designers are not necessarily interested in games. That's rather obvious. They want to make real spaces, spaces that actual humans literally walk through and move through. They don't necessarily want to make games, and some of them are, aren't good. Because we're not actually interested in interior designers. We're interested in interior design. Instead, you should read a book. In fact, most of the information that I got for this talk came from this book. Interior design's always really interested me. This is a university level interior design textbook. And it's probably one of the best sources of information I've seen talking about techniques that I'd never heard anybody talk about before, which was incredibly powerful. I've seen these things, and no doubt many of you here have already thought about these techniques themselves, but have not necessarily seen it articulated. And all of that comes from this book. Because interior design can give us so many, so many useful things. This book, it's fantastic. <laughs> However, it's also really dry. It's really boring because it's very, very technical, which is fantastic for giving us a foundation of understanding for how we create and manipulate space to increase somebody's appreciation of it. But what about exteriors? Well, check architecture. Look into the core ideas of how people build spaces. City planning is also fantastic for this as well. Actually diving into these different areas is equally as relevant. If you're dealing with a city space, uh, anything like, like watchdogs or any kind of like GTA type scenario, city planning exploration is incredibly powerful. Otherwise, we have to bash our heads against the same problems over and over again and then we would bring somebody new on, it's harder for us to explain those things in a clear and coherent way, or to just give them a book and have them watch it themselves. But with all these rules, they gotta break them. They're very useful for us to give ourselves a foundational understanding of what we're working with. But we always need to break rules. We always need to change what we're doing to ensure that we're not just 
sticking with static ideas, but instead expanding on them, breaking them to see the result. But if we don't start with rules, we don't know what we're breaking. To recap, we want to think about order and enrichment and expression. Order being how we create orientation and spatial definition. How we set someone within a space and keep them from being confused and lost. Enrichment, dealing with approachability. Spatial composition and closing surfaces. Surface articulation, novelty, and tension. These things can elevate the experience of being inside of a space. Can make it just a little bit more interesting to dive into, regardless of what our content itself might be. And expression deals with that of the world's expression, its inhabitants, and their symbolism. And every time we look at these things, we can relay these questions back to ourselves. Yeah, that's fun. We can relay these things back to ourselves through questions. Coming back to this scene, keeping in mind all of these ideas. What kind of orientation is being created? How are they dealing with spatial definition? How are they separating different areas down there through the elements within? What kind of space is implied and what's fully defined? What's the expression that you're seeing in here? You can tell something about the people here. And how is it creating tension as we move through this space? What's the feeling of tension that you're getting from it? Is it positive, negative? How are they releasing it? How are they using surface articulation, novelty, to increase our sense of orientation? How are they manipulating the enclosing surfaces through something like that staircase? Each area here is relatively novel. It's separating out every floor. And each space says something about the inhabitants as well. We can always start to get an idea of who these people are through that expression. Each area in this has a form of enrichment, order, and expression in it. The mystery that's created within each area and the novelty that's created here. And this space is full of expression built on top of everything else. When we ask ourselves about what methods we're seeing them use here, we can gain a better sense of understanding what we're doing. When we understand these things, we can master space so we can master place. Thank you. So given the time, I think we've got totally time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Cool. So I'm, uh, oh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the HGTV thing, because it's kind of a yeah. guilty pleasure of mine, right? Yeah, yeah. So I can relate to someone. Are there any other kind of shows you spotted on there that you'd suggest, like if you want to do additional research or anything like that specific? Totally. Yeah, uh, last year my talk kind of really heavily deals with HGTV um, in, a, in, in, in a very overt way. Um, the two that are really, really useful that I found uh, are Sarah 101 uh, is a really good one as an interior design show that covers some of these topics, and uh, Pure Design. Uh, the thing I find useful is having some of this fundamental understanding and some of these other details. You can start to see how they apply those techniques without necessarily referencing them uh, within all the spaces that they're working with. I find them incredibly useful to check out. This is like real, like core, really bare bones, first level kind of understandings. And to see how people use those ideas is, to me, always really useful. Yeah. Hi. Um, are there any spaces like uh, that you could think of, like uh, in the world that, like I could look up, that would be, that you think really embody all of these fantastic uh, interior designs? Um, in terms of like games or in no, terms like of real world spaces that you think are, are very good at you know, expression and orientation and things like that? Uh, it's a really good question, and I can't think of a specific example for it. Okay. Um, a lot of times that's why I try to break these things down into questions, mm -hmm. uh, so that when I'm seeing something, it's mostly about uh, even just your own experience within a space, mm -hmm. walking through it and trying to remember where was I a minute ago. And when you experience that in a space, simply being aware of these things can be helpful. Okay. Because you can see, oh, I remember where I was, and now that I think about it, it's because they had like a specific interesting picture on a wall. And sometimes that creates that identity and that structure. Uh, those are, are the best things I can suggest. Okay. Um, I would look up 
some of the, ideally some of the, the best interior designers. Even mm -hmm. just look up uh, Wikipedia is pretty good for it too. Okay. Um, for checking out, uh, I think Frank uh, Geary is uh, a fantastic, fantastic, unbelievably good interior designer, and he creates some pretty unbelievable spaces. Okay. That are probably one of the best spots to start with. Okay. Frank Geary, you said. Uh, Frank Geary. Okay. Yeah. He uh, he also the the book as well also talks a lot about very specific interior designers. Okay. All right. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, to what extent does the way a player is going to move through a space influence the way you're going to do interior design? So I'm thinking about something like mist, mm -hmm. where you're stepping through a space in a very static fashion versus a more fluid, more modern sort of game. Totally. Um, I think with something like mist, you really are more dealing with um, specific, somewhat more static compositions. It could certainly still deal with a lot of interior design, for sure. Right. Um, but I feel like that one almost becomes a little bit more of, of an in-between, mm -hmm. where you really want to focus on static compositions and two-dimensional composition, and then also inform it a little bit with how you define space and how you deal with that, because that can start to help how you might move through space, especially if the camera is in any of those situations, if it does pan and move. Mm -hmm. That's where it's most useful. If it's the static compositions for a lot of adventure games, then I, I wouldn't bother. Okay. Because two-dimensional composition there is uh, more important and more powerful. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Lee Schneider. I'm the uh, lead artist on Temple of Yogg, so I'm doing the sprites nice. and the uh, environment design. Nice. And it's a procedurally generated map, and going into it, it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, disorientation is kind of the factor, mm -hmm. so we don't really need to worry about it, but we actually found that compartmentalization was really crucial to the game, and just designing little spaces that are then procedurally introduced will reinforce that sense of orientation. So even if you're working on something that's procedurally generated, I think that all of these concepts are really, really valuable to put in your game. Awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> Thank you. Great Thank talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a level designer, game designer, uh, and arguably, like, designers should have this kind of background as well. Yes. But how, as an environment artist, when you have all of these interior design fundamentals built into you, and you're working with a level designer who's largely responsible for blocking it out, how do you guys come to terms with stuff? Um, in situations like that, if, if you have an understanding of some of these techniques, uh, then you really have to collaborate closely with your designers. Um, it is, it's, it's the worst kind of situation to have uh, a level artist and an, a level designer not, not work together. That, that can really fuck things up and break things. Um, because they're, they're so linked, uh, order is probably one of the techniques that deals most with interior design, and uh, with level design, rather. And if they don't have an understanding of that information, which is understandable, a lot of level designers don't, a lot of level artists don't, uh, a lot of people don't, unless they're in interior design, uh, or unless they, like I said, have a ton of really good taste or experience. And so if those people don't work together, you're going to have a, maybe a significant amount of order to a space at best, but then enrichment and expression have to be done by a separate process, and they're not separate processes. And so a lot of it just has to be a matter of um, really trying to talk and as much as possible educate uh, your designers on these things. Because even though at the beginning of this I said, environment artists must understand this, uh, I also, and many other level designers have agreed with me on this, that they need to understand that as well, because it's, it's critical. Hi. Uh, Hi. I don't know if it's an old question, but uh, in some games I've played, uh, I noticed that some environments seem like too wide or too high, or the height of doors don't correlate with the, with the wideness of the rooms. And I don't know if that's something that it's, it's intentional or that it's a lack of interior design. My suggestion would be when, when you're seeing something like that is um, acknowledging your experience within it and seeing, okay, well, if it is too high or if it feels too high, uh, how does that relate to some of the other techniques? Like what kind of enclosure are we getting out of this space? So for example, this room is really, really tall. Um, is that, what kind of experience are we getting within that space? Does that height create something that's interesting for us? Each of us are going to feel differently about it. Um, but to address and ask those questions about it, I think are the most useful thing that you can do. Because even though we've got like rules and techniques and specific ideas, it doesn't necessarily make this um, entirely not subjective. Mm 
we just gain a little bit more objectivity, but that's it. It's still crazy subjective. So if you experience that this place mm -hmm. feels too tall, then try to break down some of the other techniques and think about like how are they dealing with enclosure? Uh, does the space feel too tall simply because I'm really small in it or that the spatial composition of the elements within feel really big in comparison to that? Yeah. That's how you can start to like break down your feelings within that space um, so that you don't necessarily have to resort to cliches of just going, well, the space should be smaller. Because maybe it shouldn't. Maybe this room is great as tall as it is because we get these big things. Yeah, so exactly. Maybe that's where that starts to work. But me up here looking that way, it just looks too tall. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi, I'm Luke Anderson, Double Down Casino Online. I wanted to ask you about the kind of nexus between 3D composition and 2D composition mm -hmm. as it pertains to user interface or a HUD. Mm -hmm. You know, when the environment kind of blurs out, the HUD comes up, now you're in a 2D experience yeah. and that transition? I, well, um, I think that kind of, act, like having that transition uh, is, is useful, is valuable. Um, I'm not very good with UI. I'm actually pretty terrible with it. Um, so I wouldn't want to dive into that too much and, and pretend like I know, because I don't. But especially in those kind of situations, since, since the camera is not actually moving through or changing where that, that element is, a lot of times I, I feel like, yeah, you want to focus on two-dimensional composition because that, that's what's most effective for that. Mm -hmm. Whereas for interior design, it really, it really is about moving through a space and that's where that connection is. Every time that that connection is not there, I feel like interior design is, is, you know, it has techniques that are neat, but the relevance starts to just drop off. Yeah. Um, it's still cool, it's still interesting, but it's not directly applicable. And that's where I think you can start focusing on other kinds of techniques and, and other fields to draw that information from, like graphic design and stuff like that. Cool. Does that answer the question? Yeah. A little bit broad. No, it was a broad question, so that's, that's great. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, what suggestions do you have for building interesting spaces when you kind of have like a limited asset list or like pattern list? Like if you're building off of like a texture page, you may only have like two, you know, carpet patterns. You only may have like one couch type. So mm -hmm. uh, how do you suggest building spaces with interest when you do uh, have that limitation? Um, I mean, oftentimes those limitations can be useful. Um, mm -hmm. But then you start to try to, I would, I would suggest probably resorting to things like, without knowing more information mm -hmm. about the space, um, try to resort to certain things like, because you can't really deal with surface articulation in the same way if you can't add more assets. Mm -hmm. But maybe dealing with how you manipulate that enclosing surface, uh, creating curves where you can't normally. Um, in fact, interior design is very good for dealing with limitations because mm -hmm. they've always got limitations of budgets and materials. So if they want like a really like sexy, cool surface, that costs something. That costs mm -hmm. a lot more than yeah. a boring, uninteresting surface. So they're really good with limitations. Um, and I would suggest dealing with uh, perceptible patterns within that space. Okay. So the assets themselves would normally create more novelty. But since you have that limited palette of assets, you have a limited palette of novelty of objects. And so you just try to rearrange them in different patterns, in different uh, areas, so that you're getting at least um, some form of coherence and legibility and creating a little movement paths that people can work through. Maybe it's not necessarily uh, visually enriching and, and expressive that way, but it might be at least enriching to move through. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And is that it? Okay. So uh, one thing I was wondering, you know, going back to like the question on, hey, how do we communicate with people who may not have the same information as, you know, you're expressing here? Mm -hmm. um, you know, often you're talking about a space with, you know, a big group of people, let's say you're viewing a level. Do you have any like tips on how to communicate uh, fundamental issues that you see like with interior design to people that may not understand why, you know, order is important in a scene, you know, so if you're making a busy street, you know, you're like, okay, let's throw in a bunch of stuff. How many assets can we fit in the street to make it look like a busy street? Mm -hmm. Obviously that can affect, you know, the things we're talking about today. Um, again, I think the only, I'm actually realizing this will have to be the last question because I just looked at the time. Um, I think when it comes to that, when it comes to education, all I can think to do is to just keep talking about it. Um, that's kind of why I wanted to do this talk, because I found it was interesting and useful and, and would hopefully help people. And I think that's all that you can really do 
is, is implement it, show it, uh, and, and talk about the techniques that you're using. There's a lot of really specific terms in here, and I kind of wanted to keep them uh, because for us that gives us a vocabulary to work with when we're talking about spaces. So when we stay consistent with some of that language, uh, we can understand that when we're pointing to something and going, hey, this scene, it's interesting, but it's kind of lacking coherence. As long as we can repeat that thing, if someone goes, what the fuck are you talking about coherence? You can go, well, this is what I'm talking about. And, and you can keep that kind of like clear line of, of language so that people can understand what the criticism means uh, so that we don't rely on, mm, can you make it more detailed? Because I know I've done that a lot of times. Um, so keeping some of that language consistent and explaining what each part might mean when you're talking about it uh, can be hugely helpful, I find. Thank you. Thank you guys for showing up. It's, it's pretty early. And so.